Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, lesson number 59, we'll take a look at the trade-offs associated with loose coupling. I talked a lot about component and service coupling in lesson 29. If you haven't seen that lesson, I would highly recommend pausing this lesson and looking at that one first. But within that lesson, I talked about the types and levels of component and service level coupling. The types of coupling, coupling with afferent or incoming, efferent or outgoing, and temporal, which are non-static timing dependencies. I then talked in Lesson 57 about loose coupling and correspondingly the law of Demeter. And if you haven't seen that lesson either, I also would highly encourage you to see that one first before this one. Now in the law of Demeter, I kind of showed a way of actually building loosely coupled systems. But I didn't talk about one important factor. And that was the trade-offs of loose coupling. And let me show you and illustrate this through a very simple microservices example. Let's say we have our API layer or our reverse proxy, and that fronts a lot of services in our, let's say, a just simple order entry system. And so let's say we have an order placement service, and that service, that microservice, is responsible for accepting, validating, and kind of overall placement of an order. Uh, then we have a notification service, and this is responsible for notifying the customer of that order being placed. I then have a separate microservice that's a payment microservice, and this microservice is single purpose, um, fine grained, and also um, uh, does one thing really well. It has, knows how to apply the payments and for that order placement. I also have an inventory microservice, and this microservice manages all the inventory and how much inventory we have of each item. I also have a warehouse service, and this microservice is responsible for making sure that our products are balanced correctly between all the various warehouses across the country so that we can guarantee very quick shipment. And finally, I've got a supplier service. And this microservice knows the supplier associated with each item so that when we run low on stock, we can get more from a supplier to a particular warehouse. Now, when we place an order or simply kind of the old catalog checkout, all six of these microservices are involved. Let's say we place an order. And so order placement, once it validates and accepts that order, generates an order ID needs to invoke the notification service. And let's say we make a RESTful call over there. And that order placement's responsibility is not to notify the customer. But what it does is it sends a RESTful request to the notification service to notify that customer, whether it be through email or text maybe or some other means. I also need to send a RESTful call over to payment service. And these could be done at the same time. That doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be synchronous. But now I make a RESTful call over there to say, apply a payment however the customer wanted it, whether it be credit card, store balance, a credit card, whichever. I then need to make another RESTful call over to the inventory service to be able to decrement the inventory that I reserved previously for that order when it was being placed. Now, the inventory service, upon decrementing the inventory, now needs to notify the warehouse service that we're running low in a particular area or region and to start moving product between those warehouses. It also notices that volume is getting much lower, so it in turn invokes a RESTful call to a supplier microservice, which in turn knows how to contact that supplier and order more inventory. Now, if we analyze this very simple but real example, we see a lot of levels of coupling here. As a matter of fact, the order placement CA, again, knowing that afferent or incoming, CE is efferent or outgoing, and CT is the total coupling level. Notice there's no incoming between services on order placement. There's three outgoing, however. Notification service has one incoming, no outgoing, so its total is one. Payment has one incoming and also no outgoing, and so that also has a control total of one. Inventory service also has an incoming of one, but an outgoing, a CE, of two coupling levels, and so that total is three. Warehouse has one for a total of one, and supplier has one. This doesn't look bad, 
But just between these six services, there is a total coupling level, everybody here, of 10. Let me show you how to fully decouple every one of these services. Rather than making all these restful calls between these, what I'm going to do is leverage both a topic and cues within messaging to further decouple these components. Now, this is going to be true async messaging. I'm not going to wait for a reply. And so watch what happens here. The order placement service, upon receiving an order and creating that order ID, publishes a message to a topic saying, order one, two, three has been created. Now at this time, this is a handoff, everybody. This is just a fire and forget message to that topic. Now, the notification, payment, and inventory services all receive that message and consequently apply the payment, apply notifications, and decrement inventory. The inventory service, upon decrementing inventory, realizes we need to balance uh, the amount in a certain warehouse, so it sends a fire and forget message over to the warehouse service. Actually, curiously enough, it doesn't send it to the warehouse service. It sends it to a queue. See, all the inventory service knows how to do here is basically say, I need to send a message to a queue saying, we need more items in this warehouse. Now, the warehouse service receives that particular message, tries to balance out to say, do we have other stock in other warehouses I can transfer? No. In that case, it sends a message, again, fire and forget, to a queue. The supplier service happens to be listening on that queue, picks up that message, and orders more stock for that particular warehouse. So we have the same flow, isn't it interesting? But let's analyze the coupling level. And we don't have to actually go through each service because the coupling level here between services is in fact zero. Because you see, especially with the example that I can illustrate here between order placement and the notification payment and inventory. Order placement really does not know which services, if any, are even going to pick up that message. How many, which types. As a matter of fact, inventory service doesn't know which warehouse service or which kind of system is going to pick that message up. And so effectively, what we have done here is fully decoupled the communication points between these. Now, I will admit, that we do have a total coupling level of zero here, but we are coupled by contract. And there's other ways of dealing with that with CDC, consumer-driven contracts and value-driven contracts. But we'll keep that for another Software Architecture Monday lesson. Now, while this, I've reduced the amount to zero, the question I want to bring up in this particular lesson is what are the trade-offs of this loose coupling. As a matter of fact, if we analyze this loose coupling and realize we still have the same flows, we don't have services that are actually decoupled to one another. As a matter of fact, because this is async, everybody, none of those services need be up. Whenever they're up, they process everything. So the first kind of trade-off that we see with the benefit of loose coupling really becomes workflow control. In other words, I no longer have control over that workflow. As I indicated in Lesson 57, the law of Demeter, uh, that's the law of pr the principle of least knowledge, which really means the less knowledge you have of the system, the more loose coupling you will have. What does order placement know about the workflow? And the answer here now is nothing. It doesn't know about notification, payment, inventory, and possibly some other step. You see, the point here is one of the trade-offs of loose coupling is that we start to lose some of that workflow control. We have no mediator here. Things just kind of happen through these decoupled messages. As a matter of fact, the other thing you're probably seeing right here and hoping I'm going to get to next, which I will, is error handling. If we cannot apply a payment or we find that the inventory is in fact not available. Now I have error handling issues of knowing how to now circle back and possibly leverage sagas, which is in another lesson. If you look back, um, it's about two or three lessons back <coughs> to be able to apply those, which starts adding the other trade-off, which is error handling and complexity. You know, another 
piece that we have here is because of that lack of workflow control and because we're so decoupled, now I potentially have data consistency issues. In other words, uh, the fact that the order's been placed and the customer's been notified, but we couldn't make payment, we've decremented the inventory, uh, but we still haven't approved that order. And so we start having data inconsistency issues or data consistency issues where inventory has been decremented, but the payment actually hasn't been applied. This would never work, everybody, if we're trying to book a flight and we've reserved a seat and that seat gets reserved and everything's async and we've never been able to make a payment. That means no one can reserve that seat. No one can purchase any of this inventory now, especially if it's low. And the other one is transaction state management. In other words, the flow here of the transaction is very difficult now to manage because I have to have all this state transfer between all these, which is probably going to generate about another 20 different kinds of messages. And so the point I really wanted to make in this lesson, everybody, is what we do stri try to strive for in our architectures is in fact loose coupling. But what I really want you to be aware of is that whole architectural thinking aspect of always considering the trade-offs. And in fact, there probably is a balance here between some form of coupling in order to achieve better data consistency, better workflow control, and better error handling. All right, for more information, uh, certainly please look at Lesson 29 and also 57. I've provided the links here just to get more information about loose coupling, service coupling, and again, that reference to the law of Demeter. Um, all these lessons are located in Software Architecture Monday on my website under Lessons. And I do offer three different private training classes as well that you can have and bring into your company. I have a three-day Software Architecture Fundamentals class, a one-day microservices architecture and design, and then a one-day hands-on analyzing software architecture class. Some of those are available in public and also at conferences I speak at. And so if you go to the upcoming events portion of my website there, uh, you can see where I'm going to be speaking next, either live or online. So this has been Software Architecture Monday, Lesson 59, uh, The Trade-Offs of Loose Coupling. Again, my name is Mark Richards, and stay tuned every other Monday for another free 5 to 10 minute lesson on software architecture. Thank you so much for listening.